Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Smart Money. Now this is a very special episode for us. We're celebrating our 21st birthday. Yes, CNBC TV 18 turns 21 this year, this week in fact. And joining us today on this birthday special edition of Smart Money is Nirmal Jain, the chairman and CEO of IFL Finance. Nirmal, thanks so much for being with us. In fact, you have been a part of our long 21-year journey. So you've been a friend, uh, you've been an advisor. Thanks for being with us today on the show. No, thanks, Sonia. And I think uh, 21 years have been amazing for stock markets and the role uh, that your channel has, been, uh, has played is really commendable and stellar. So congratulations and all the best for next 21. Oh, thank you. I don't know if I'm going to be here for the next 21 years for sure. It's been a wonderful but journey. It, it has been a wonderful journey, yes. And of course, I've had a chance to be a part of a major majority of this journey. But you said that it's been great for the market so far Absolutely. as well. Um, Nirmal, this is a time when the market is at a record high, right? So how does one really look at it right now? Are you getting mm. a bit cautious or is this a time to just ride the wave? So let's look at last 21 years, uh, say from 1999 till now. So 1999 to 2003, markets did not move anywhere. From 2003 to 2007, markets multiplied almost seven times. Uh, from 2007 to 2020, Nifty's compounded return has been just 3%, uh, lower than uh, your government securities also. And now market is catching up. Uh, so market is all-time high, no doubt about it, but still is valued at say 22 to 24 times FI21 earnings, which all of us know are depressed because of COVID. And uh, so there are number, I mean, there are quite a few things which are going for the market and earnings bounce back. Uh, and I would say that, uh, you know, once you stay invested in equities, it's a good time to be uh, invested in equities if you're not already. Uh, so don't worry about the record high because every time uh, market has to keep moving up, uh, but it's a great time to be invested for a number of reasons. Let me talk about a few. One is that last five years we had huge uh, disappointment on earnings all the time. But now it looks that uh, probably we'll have a positive surprise or at least double digit earnings growth uh, for next five years. And market will always reflect, I mean, reflect that uh, with a multiplier because market always uh, uh, you know, tends to move uh, in a leverage way. Uh, two, liquidity has eased and uh, the impact of that is that interest rates are going down and we should know globally whenever interest rates go down, uh, money tends to, you know, the asset allocation tends to move uh, more in favor of equities and you see the P multiples also go up. Uh, the new normal of P multiple is always higher. And uh, three, as we say that the recovery is happening uh, because of several measures that government will take on monetary as well as fiscal and after any crisis or after any uh, you know, event like this or a you know, period of pandemic or any crisis for that matter, uh, we see that there's strong revival that happens. And it's happening globally because <coughs> the, what is helping India is not only liquidity or the measures which Indian government is taking, but globally uh, there is a move by all the government to try and say that make liquidity easier, uh, try and create more jobs, try and make growth faster, uh, which augurs well for uh, global economies. Okay, so I want to develop a little bit on that theme, uh, Nirmal. But before that, since it's our 21st birthday and, you know, you've been in this market for so long, if you had to give one piece of advice to your 21-year-old self when you turn 21, what would your big advice be? Hmm. So, if you're an investor, then, uh, you know, I think investor will make money by inaction. Brokers will make money by action. So, as an investor, try and stay invested for long term. I mean, don't mind my advice, uh, but don't watch the channel all the time and trade. Just relax, stay invested. First one to say that, you know, there are so many people who tell us on the channel that, you know, investors mm. should just cut the noise, cut through the noise, not listen to channels all day. So we don't mind it at all. Any advice is good. But mm. coming back to the market yeah. itself, um, is, do you think that this is the 2003 kind of a period when we saw you know, a parabolic move in the market? Or do you think that a large part of this bull run is already behind us? So, okay, maybe something in the middle uh, is not uh, maybe as... Uh, uh, I don't think that, you know, the rise from here will be as swift and as uh, like a bull market of 2003 to 2007. 
Uh, at the same time, I don't think that the large part of Delhi is behind us. So maybe somewhere in between, I think there's a good market ahead. Uh, it may not be, uh, you know, okay, it may not multiply, it may not grow uh, at compounded rate of 2003 to 2007, but still, I think 15 to 20% compounded return is what one can expect in the next three to five or four years. Okay, 15 to 20% compounded return, that's not bad at all. Uh, what should the big asset allocation strategy be for the new year? I mean, st should a large part of the money still be allocated towards equities or do you see other options because real estate is picking up so much. Gold has had a fabulous run. I mean, if one would have just put all their money in gold last year, they would have made the most amount of money this year. Uh, what do you think the most prudent asset allocation strategy should be now for the next year? So obviously asset allocation will vary from investor to investor depending on your risk appetite, how much of uh, the risk appetite is ability as well as willingness both uh, because there are people who have stomach for risk and there are people who also should have uh, uh, you know, the adequate resources for that. But typically uh, you know, uh, you know, if you do equity allocation between say 30 to 60 percent, there's a time when it should be nearer the peak say around 60 percent. Gold has already run up maybe up to 5% is something in case you are an h &I investor. Real estate, uh, again, uh, you know, invest only maybe for your requirement and if you are really very wealthy and you want to have a rental yield, you may allocate up to 10% and the remaining 20-25% can be in the debt, fixed income or uh, liquid uh, instruments. So equity will be the dominant part of your asset allocation, typically 60%, but as I said, uh, this will vary from investor to investor. Okay, got that. So that's the asset allocation strategy. Let's now talk about some big themes, right, Nirmal? Um, so far, up until now this year, the big theme was a lot of these COVID-related plays, whether it's IT, whether it's pharma, uh, the guys who benefit from work from home, the digital plays. Now that seems to have played out. In the next leg of this rally, where do you think the leaderships, leadership will emerge from? I think cyclicals will do very well. So stock like metals, commodities, you know, we, that have been bitten down. And what we are seeing is that China is seeing a very robust recovery in their economy and demand. So, uh, okay, chemicals, pharmaceuticals, IT sector, these three sectors did very well last year, primarily, you know, okay, driven by COVID, as well as uh, global factors. So chemical, you know, what we are seeing is that there has been a climb down in China and that's what India has benefited from. Also, if there's a recovery and a strong liquidity in, say, U.S. and developed markets, uh, we'll see there's a boost for IT and pharma as well. Uh, pharma, again, because there's strong awareness about health and the spending on health is increasing, not only for COVID and vaccine, but otherwise also. Uh, so all these three sectors have played out well. I think stay invested. But other than that, I think metals, commodities, infrastructure, you know, that these are the sectors uh, that should lead now uh, uh, in 2021. Okay, you know, I was going because to... Because these sectors... Sure. Uh, sure, go ahead. Yeah. These are high beta sectors, valuations are still attractive and earnings momentum can be very strong in these sectors. Okay, but since uh, March of 2020, some of these sectors have really rallied, right? I mean, the Nifty Metal Index, for example, is up 99% and we have that graphic coming up for you on the screen since the lows in March. Uh, you still see more to go in the commodity space despite the rally that we've seen? Yeah, I think uh, still if you see the valuations based on their earnings or intrinsic uh, value of replacing a particular capacity, then still they're attractive. But again, you'll have to do a bottom-up stock picking because, uh, uh, you know, depending on what their debt is, what their market, uh, you know, the product portfolio is. But still, metals like steel and maybe aluminum also, uh, they will do well. Uh, also, cement has done well. Infrastructure plays, there are many good companies there. I mean, they do... Typically, the companies are good if they don't have too much of debt and the execution track record is good uh, or they should do well. Okay. Agriculture, again, is a very strong theme to play. Uh, fertilizer, seed companies, uh, and they should do also well. Okay, so we've spoken about a lot of themes. Um, I also want to ask you about the mid-cap versus large-cap allocation because I was going through some of the mutual fund returns since the lows in Feb. And uh, some of these mid-cap funds, if you had invested in the month of February, you would have already made about 25, you know, 20, 25% returns in an average mid-cap fund. Doesn't even have to be an exceptional one. Uh, do you think that this mid-cap outperformance is something that could perhaps continue? And is that a would you give that a higher allocation compared to large-cap funds? 
for a retail investor? Uh, yeah, so last five years, or maybe last 10, 12 years, mid-caps have disappointed, uh, but now is the time. And typically what we have seen that most of the foreign investors tend to buy large cap, and most of the domestic mutual funds tend to balance their portfolios and invest in mid-cap also. So mid-cap is a very large universe. You can't really uh, uh, you know, paint the entire sector with one brush, so you know, pick up the right kind of stocks. But yes, uh, you'll have more opportunities in mid-cap because the number of stocks are more. And for a retail investor, they don't want to invest large money, unlike, say, foreign investor, foreign uh, FPIs. Uh, then obviously, opportunities will be there. And, uh, you know, mid cap has done well in the last nine months, but I think uh, rally can continue. But having said that, one has to be cautious in this sector uh, because, say, when we say mid cap, they are 500 stocks, okay? Out of that, not every stock will be great. Some of the stocks can be dangerous, so depending on the promoters and what kind of businesses they are in. Ideally, a typical retail investor will be better off going through mutual fund in mid caps or so. What happens in the mutual fund? You get a, a get a basket of stocks, so your risk is diversified, and obviously the fund manager will do a much better job than typical investor. Okay, well, uh, more traction perhaps in the mid cap space. The best is yet to come, right? Nirmal, since it's our birthday week, uh, I'm not going to let you go without giving us some big themes and perhaps telling us some stocks as well. But I'm going to do one thing. I'm going to take a short commercial break on smart money. Don't go anywhere. When we come back from the break, more on our chat with Nirmal Jain. We're celebrating 21 years of CNBC TV 18. Stay tuned. Welcome back, folks. You're watching Smart Money on CNBC TV 18. It's a special, special day and a special week. We're celebrating 21 long years of guts and glory at CNBC TV 18. Nirmal Jain, the chairman of and CEO of IFL Finance, is with us and joining us as a part of the celebrations. Uh, Nirmal, before the break, we were talking about some big themes. But before that, I want to talk also about this left out feeling that a lot of people are having in the market. There are many retail investors, h and investors that, that still have not participated. Are you noticing that as well? And do you think because of this left out feeling, there could be another big burst in this market as we head into the new year? Yeah, I think you're right that there's a left out feeling. Most of the h &I investors or even retail investors are underinvested. Many of them may have just about 30% exposure and uh, they always thought that uh, market is, uh, you know, rallied a lot, uh, valuations are very expensive. So what happened when the COVID happened, market people thought that this is unprecedented, economies will get into recession. Many people sold their good stocks that they were holding for years and they could never buy them back. So I would say that, you know, this is always true in this market that don't get into trying to time the market, stay invested, always have certain allocation to equities regardless of what happens. We have seen 9-11, 26-11, we have seen recessions, we have seen drought, we have seen war, everything but stock markets and the companies and businesses are for long term. And even now, many people may think that stocks are exp expensive and they are not able to take direct exposure. Uh, take uh, some exposure through mutual fund. But if you're liquid, then uh, of course, I don't have a crystal ball to know what will happen uh, in the next one year or two years or five years. But as far as I'm concerned, uh, I would say that one must stay invested in equities. And even now, it's not too late to stay, uh, you know, get invested if you're not already. So the markets have rallied. Don't look at last six months or nine months. Look at the fact that 22 to 24 times this year's are multi earnings multiple, the market. Uh, and given that the earnings this year are very depressed, next year and year after will be a strong rebound. Still, there's a lot of steam. Uh, so rather than picking up you know, stocks one by one, uh, get invested through mutual fund. That's a better way. I mean, those who are left out or those who are feeling of left out. Hey, let's talk about some big themes now. Uh, you were telling me that the theme that you like the most is, is this whole financialization of savings and the NBFC space. Um, tell us about that. What is the big trigger there? Because many of these NBFC stocks like the Bajaj Twins, for example, have you know already risen about 60-70% from their lows. What do you think is the big story here? So, you know, the financial market banks and NBFCs were bitten down a lot after the COVID and now people are realizing that 
the problems or the delinquencies in assets may not be as bad as people expected and the businesses and the economy is recovering faster than mo what most people thought uh, it would and therefore uh, quality of assets as well as new loan dispersal is picking up. Now as far as NBFC is concerned because we have our own NBFC that you know uh, I may be biased uh, but my view is as follows that in this last two years not only COVID the crisis in NBFC started uh, with Ireland FS default the liquidity crisis and that has forced the entire sector to sort of restructure itself. Uh, so earlier NBFCs were funding retail as well as a retail where banks are not able to reach out say the last mile reach to the customers the small customers who may not have income records or who may not have adequate uh, credit uh, uh, score and also the wholesale uh, funding say promoter funding or real estate developers where banks were reluctant or not allowed to fund. Now I think the wholesale funding will go away. The promoter funding and the real estate developer funding will happen through AIFs or funds or private equity. So NBFCs that will survive will focus mostly on uh, retail assets. Of course there can be some NBFCs that can be wholesale but the dominant part of sector or the growth will come from retail assets and there you know there is a huge complementary fit with what banks want to do. You look at this way, banks have got huge surplus money that they put at RBI at reverse repo rate of 3.35. Obviously they are not able to originate as much retail assets as they would like to and that's where they can partner with NBFCs, NBFCs can originate these assets which banks can refinance or banks can buy these assets. So going forward NBFCs uh, with retail orientation should do very well because interest rates are going down, liquidity is easing and the demand for credit will pick up as the economy recovers. And the last mile connectivity what NBFCs have can't be replaced by banks uh, overnight and there's a huge liquidity or money available with the banking system. Mm. Uh, so it's very interesting uh, time in the history of NBFC sector. The industry will uh, reorient itself towards retail and pro or what we have seen in last two crises, 1998 and 2008, mm. that those who survive, uh, they have a very good run over the next four to five years mm. in the NBFC sector. And I think that is what will play out this time again. That's what my view is. So what about some of these niche NBFCs, the ones that finance specific sectors like say auto financers for example, tractor financers for example. Do you think that the best is yet to come even for names uh, like these? So you know the truck or you know, these are cyclical industries. So mm -hmm. what we see that they have cycles. So they will have a few years of absolutely robust or a very good growth where the operating leverage will play out and their earnings will rise more than proportionately and their NPS will also be low. Say commercial vehicle typically your non-performing assets can you know, vary from 3% to 12%. It's a wide range. And when the cycle is down then you know, they get into difficulty. Looks like that probably you know, we have seen the trough of the cycle and things will recover. And uh, some of these uh, within NBFCs these, uh, these kind of companies are more cyclical, uh, relatively more volatile in their earnings and asset quality. Uh, may have an up cycle in the next few years. Okay, and since it's our birthday week, you have to leave us with some names, Nirmal. I know you generally don't like to talk stocks, but yeah, I mean, you know, what would your pick of the pack be in the NBFC space? In NBFC space? Yes, since that is your big theme. Hello. No, my, as an individual, I'm invest. My largest part of my shareholding is in IFL Finance, but you know, it's a company <laughs> which I'm a promoter of, so I can talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then let's leave the NBFC space aside but because the of the stakeholders that you my, are. My, if, if you look at my port, yes, absolutely. Uh, hmm. Any other any other stocks that right. stand out for you? No, so if you look at IT, then uh, you have stocks like uh, uh, Infosys, which is very good, or you know Persistent Emphasis. These are the stocks that are you know research recommends. I don't get into nitty gritties, but I read our research. Uh, so in every sector like they, they are recommending Tata Steel and Steel if you want to do, uh, pick up cyclical. Uh, if you want to look at FMCG then stocks like Dabur or uh, Nestle or Hindustan Lever they are the recommended stocks. So I think now good thing about the rally now or the bull market what we are seeing now is very broad based. And probably you will have opportunities in all the sectors. You only have to pick up the right stocks either leaders or stocks which are growing very well and have a good track record in terms of management.
Okay. And there are lots of them. And you know. Sure. Mm, go yeah. ahead. Go ahead. Uh, so all sectors will have stocks. So I can go on, but I think you know. The best is to pick up our model portfolio and look at our research on our website. <laughs> okay, I'm sure people will do that. But since a lot of millennials, Thank a lot you of so young much. investors watch this show, I mean, it's generally directed towards the you know millennial generation. What would your advice be finally before we let you go uh, to the youngsters who are sort of entering the market yeah. now? <clears throat> how does one prepare themselves? Because at the end Absolutely. of the day, you have to do your own research, right? So how do you prepare yourself? What are the books that Absolutely. you would read? Uh, what are the sources that you tap into? Okay, so one is uh, don't leverage, don't trade in FNO to start with. You know, it requires a lot of practice and a lot of uh, skills and a lot of risk appetite. So the millennials who are starting their career and their savings have just started to come in. Allocate your assets prudently. Some part to equity, maybe start with mutual fund. Some part to debt and liquid. Avoid leveraging. Avoid FNO. And uh, again. So there are people who are working in different kind of industries and there are people who want to have a full-time career in the stock market. So you know, if you want to have a full-time career in the stock market, obviously you'll watch uh, channels like CNBC, you'll watch websites uh, like ours and you know, you do your research. Uh, but if you are not a professional fully dedicated to this career, uh, then I would say that you know, start with mutual fund, that's always a good idea. And as you get experience and confidence, you'll pick up a direct equity portfolio over a period of time. But before I... A sign off, you know, I think congratulations to the channel and it's been a phenomenal uh, role you have played in you know, spreading equity cult and growth of capital market in this country. Thank you so much, Nirmal. And you have been a big part of that journey. So we hope you continue to be our friend, our follower and our guide as we move towards the next 21 years. Thank you so much. And we hope we can earn and learn together. Well, uh, it's time to wrap up on this edition of Smart Money. Thanks so much for watching, but don't go anywhere. Lots more coming up on CNBC TV 18.